Isaiah chapter 55. Now we need to uh, address a few things about Isaiah. First of all, he's one of the most important of the writing prophets. He writes a book that gets divided into 66 chapters. And in fact, one of the major discoveries in biblical archaeology was what's called the Isaiah Scroll and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's of this very, very good condition copy of the book of Isaiah that dates back to about the time of Jesus. And now why that's important is this. Many of our copies, especially of the Hebrew for the Old Testament, up until the, the mid-1900s, only existed, we, we had copies that had been made that dated to about the 12 to 1300 AD range. We felt like they were good copies because they were meticulously hand copied. A lot of attention was paid to them. And a lot of care was taken in making these copies. But that was as old as they were. So there was always that little bit of concern. Well, what about this? Could this possibly, you know, might somebody have misspelled something? And we found when we looked at the Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls that in fact, yes, a few spelling errors had been made in things like people's names. But beyond that, the Isaiah scroll that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, some 1,200 years older than the most recent and the most commonly used copy of the book of Isaiah, with the exception of a couple of name spellings, was 99% identical. And that helped, that, that helped assure folks and assures us that the copies made of the Hebrew Old Testament from the time of Jesus until the time that we started using a printing press and really managed to keep everything at the same. They were as meticulously copied as the, the tradition taught. They were valuable, they were and they were, insofar as we can tell, correct. And that's important for us to understand that God's word does not change. God's word does not, does not falter and he has provided for us the scripture that we need. Now, can we prove that scientifically? We cannot. In fact, it is a matter of faith. It is a claim that we make that we believe that scripture is God-breathed and accurate because we believe that's what God has said about it. We see evidence of that in some of the various realities of scripture. When you have the word of God, you have something that we think is written across the span of centuries, and yet it has a cohesive message. We see Isaiah prophesy things that will happen and we see them come true several hundred years later. We see various things happen in, in, such, in such a manner. Some of Isaiah's prophecies are so off the map in terms of what one would expect in history that the only other explanation for them is that perhaps Isaiah is written after they occur. And yet we find evidence that Isaiah is written well before they happen. When Isaiah writes that the people of Israel would be restored to the Holy Land by the Persians, nobody expected that the Persians would even rule over that one piece of territory. They were a faraway empire that had never gotten involved in the issues of Israel and that area of land. And yet, as Isaiah prophesied, not only does, I, does Persia become the, the empire that allows the Jews to return from Babylon and return from exile, but then they become the dominant force in the politics of the Middle Eastern world for 200 years. And it's something that from an historical perspective, there's no reason to, to even have guessed would happen. That would be like looking in the 1500s and predicting that there would come a time during the 1500s, the 1600s, as Europe is racked by wars and cruelty and all sorts of violence, that would be like sitting there and saying, there, there's going to come a time that those colonists that have fled these wars and started these little small colonies on that new world, in that new world place, they'll be the major player in a massive war between Germany and the rest of the world. In a time when Germany was a divided nation, the number of colonists in the United in what becomes the New World was less than the population of one state these days. You wouldn't have predicted that, apart from having some form of exceptional insight. And Isaiah, we believe, is empowered by the Holy Spirit to see these things, that God shows him that. 
Isaiah writes an extended, extended book. And it goes through so many differing ideas that some people have suggested that Isaiah is written by not one person, but it hadn't been written by too many people. There are too many mood shifts. The first part of Isaiah from chapter 1 through chapter 39, really from 1 through 36, is kind of, it's not happy. There's a lot of gloom and despair and agony. Chapters 37, 38, 39 are history. They're actually almost word for word what we have in 2 Kings about the events around the life of Hezekiah. And then starting in chapter 40, from 40 through 66, and especially from 55 to 66, 40 to 54, and 55 to 66, they're not exactly happy, but they have a much brighter look at the future. The Isaiah of chapters 1 through 39, he is not someone who sees the glasses half, half empty. He sees it as, wait a minute, somebody took the other half of my coffee. I'm not happy. It's very pessimistic. 40 through 66 is the, is the optimistic side of it. Things are not going well, but things will go better. Tonight we'll look at Isaiah chapter 40 and deal with a couple of the things that we see there. But this morning I want us to look at 55 to see something that we see here. And, and I think that Isaiah is a person who I think as he goes through, you have his commission. And if you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard Isaiah chapter 6 dealt with and preached through. It's an important passage. We have this idea of in Isaiah chapter 6. is in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up train his robe filled the temple and this picture of Isaiah's call and of the glory of God and Isaiah is told by God you're going to go to these people and he gets told something that is is actually kind of a downer to start with he, he starts his ministry with God telling him I'm going to send you these people they will be ever seeing but not perceiving ever hearing but not understanding guess what you're going to go do Isaiah you're going to go preach to this nation for the rest of your life and they're not going to get it And then Isaiah, throughout the rest of the first major section of his book, I think he deals with the fact that he keeps preaching and people don't get it. But as he turns the page to chapter 40, and really he doesn't turn a page, he does a scroll. And in fact, one of the things I would love to do in Jerusalem, they have a museum dealing with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in the entryway they have a replica of the Isaiah scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's this massive scroll that got it hanging from the ceiling all and around. Of this, of, it's a replica of this scroll, and I would love to go and see that. Uh, you know, you just look up, and there's the word of the Lord above you. And I think that Isaiah has a mood shift himself. I think he sees something, and he finally understands when he's preaching when he hits chapter 40. And especially as he gets on into the rest of it, he sees that you're right. Sometimes people don't get it. But it's not really about the people anyway. It's about the Lord. So we find this in Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah calls out, everyone who thirsts comes to the water. No, that's not what he starts with. He starts with an exclamation. Ho! Or if you wanted to modernize it, Yo! He starts with an exclamation to get people's attention. He starts with a shout. Everybody, look over here. Ho! Come to the waters. Now, we don't always get this image of waters. And that's why the, I, I like the songs that we sang. They tie in with this idea but we don't always get it because for us, you know, a, a body of water that's as wide as this middle row of pews, that's, just, that's not that big a deal. It's a creek, it's a stream, it's a drain levee. You know, that's no big deal. We've got drainage ditches. I remember growing up, we had drainage ditches this wide. That's not that big a deal. We get two inches of rain in a week. We say, oh, well, you know, that's plenty of rain. We'll be all right for the next week. But Isaiah is preaching to people who understand the desert. They understand the idea of the rainy season, of the, the wet season and the dry season. They understand that if it doesn't rain for three weeks in the spring and three weeks in the fall, they're doomed. They don't have
out deep water wells. When they don't get rain, it's not that it's going to cost too much money to keep the water on the rise. If they don't get rain, they're dead. Because the streams will dry up and there will be nothing to water the crops with. They've been through the desert. They know what this is like. They know what it is to deal with having not enough water to do anything, to accomplish anything. And he cries out, come to the waters. When you travel, that was one of the things that you looked for is where are the waters? As we go through life, where is this? We can't stay where we are. One of the things that Isaiah is prophesying about and he has preached and taught to the people of Judah is the fact that the time is coming that they're going to go in exile from their land. They're going to be away from home. They're going to be away from where things are comfortable. They're going to be away from where they fit. They're not going to be in a spot where everybody worships the Lord. They're not going to be in a place that things are always good. They're going to be in the midst of chaos and in the midst of trial and trouble and tribulation. They're going to wander through the wilderness. And when you load up and wander through the wilderness with a caravan of women and children and elderly folks and horses and donkeys and pack animals who need water, that's a major problem. And you would send out the scouts and the forerunners and they would look around for where can they find. But you cannot live with that. A human being can survive approximately three days without water, but the last day and a half they're absolutely miserable. You shut down after about, after about a day and a half. You can survive that next 36 hours, but you can't do much. You could barely go a day without water. And so you send out the scouts to find it. And Isaiah here fulfills the role of the prophet by proclaiming as that scout, Oh, over here, come to the waters. This is where this is. This is what we need. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Says, but not only is there water here, not only can you come and drink, but you can come and eat. You have no money, come buy, eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Come. All that you need is here. If you are hungry, if you're thirsty, what you need is here. And there may not be the security, and there may not be all the things that you are expecting and what you're looking for. But what you need is right here. And then the next verse we go on and we see that he's speaking to people that are wasting their efforts. So why are you spending your money on the things that are not food? Your wages on the stuff that doesn't satisfy. Why are you doing this? Why are you put all this effort forward? And everything you get from it doesn't meet any need that you have. And I tell you that Isaiah speaks as clearly to us as the people that gather at Elmira Baptist Church as he, is, as he speaks to the people of Judah. Never mind how he speaks to our culture at large. How much of our effort goes into the things that we don't need? And in fact, the things that don't even satisfy us. They don't even meet the, the needs and the wants that we already have. We spend our money and our effort and our time to accomplish what? So that at the end of the day, we can say, well, I managed to get more stuff than the other guy. So that at the end of the day, we can say, well, maybe tomorrow I'll do something that is eternally significant, but today at least. I made sure people knew I was important. And Isaiah here doesn't say that we shouldn't go to work every day. He talks about the wages. So why do you spend your wages on what doesn't satisfy you? You ever stopped and looked at your budget? 
And consider how much of your wages go to things that don't satisfy you. Now, keep things in perspective. Your electric bill satisfies you. Don't believe me? Wait till it gets to be 100 degrees again. Or go home to your fridge and unplug it for a day and see if your electric bill satisfies you. But there are so many other ways that we do that. That we spend on things that don't satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. The abundance of what we need doesn't come from the wages that we earn. Isaiah saw that. Paul saw that. God put those two things together in, our script, in the Scripture so that we could know it. That the things that we earn don't do us much good. We're reminded that the wages of sin are death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The abundance that we have is from God's grace. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. We live in a, a strange and perilous time where the world is a wilderness place that it's hard sometimes to find those places. And yet if we will listen to what the word of the Lord has said, if we will listen to what he has said through his prophets, through his word, what he is saying to us, if we will come to the waters and come to him, then we find what we need. And not only do we find a little bit of what we need, but we find an abundance But so often we take that abundance and first of all we're a little hesitant to take of it for ourselves in the first place. Whether it's because we were raised that we don't want no handouts from nobody. Or if we are, we're raised that hey there's no such thing as a free lunch and we're afraid of what's going to happen if we take it. Whether it's a pride that says I will only take what I earn. Or if it's a fear that says, I'm afraid of what's coming in the other hand. We're afraid to take of the abundance for ourselves. And like someone who goes to, the, to a cardiologist and says, Doc, I've got some problems. I don't feel real good when I get up in the morning. And the doctor does a scan and says, well, you need quintuple bypass surgery. And you need it before the end of the week or you're probably going to drop dead. And after that, you're going to have to, you know, eat healthy and start to exercise. And you have to cut back. You cannot eat a pound of bacon a day as much as you like it. It's just not safe. But I've got to do surgery on you. In fact, I've got to slot this afternoon. We're going to do that heart surgery, and then you can do all these things and get better. And you look back at the doctor and say, Doc, why don't we do this? Mark me down for that surgery in six months. I'm going to go home. I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to start to exercise. And besides that, I want to get a haircut, get looking nicer before I have surgery. And spiritually, so many of us do that. We go to the Lord and we say, Lord, we, we say, God, we, we like things to be changed. You know, we've we, we got a problem. God says, you've got a bigger problem than you think. You're not just winded, you're dead. And the only hope for you is to start at this point and have new life brought to you through the power of Jesus Christ and the power of His resurrection as He forgives your sins and puts a new life in you. And our answer is, well, Lord, why don't I go quit sinning first? Folks, you can't do it any more than somebody who's dead can quit being dead to walk themselves to the hospital. There's a reason we want an AED here. It's because if somebody's heart stops, something's got to start it back. You can't just let them lay there and hope it gets better. Spiritually, apart from Christ, we're dead. And there is an abundance of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we want to put up our pride walls and say, I don't want it. Let me do half the work, God, and you can do the other half. But I'll tell you this, if you were to be laying here on the floor with your heart stopped, you wouldn't want us sitting there saying, well, we'll put one of these pads from this little zapping thing on you, and we'll let you do the other half of the work. You want it all. And there's an abundance of life in Christ. But we put up this wall and we say, I don't want it. 
I want to earn it. He could only acknowledge that Jesus has done for you what you are and what you need, and that you can't stop sinning and you can't make yourself good enough to deserve where God says, hey, this, well, I'm glad to have you. Because my kingdom was, 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 wasn't going to get anything done with that until you came along. Did we come and we said, Lord, we don't have anything to bring. And he says, that's okay. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. As <coughs> some of you hold your breath a little bit when we read that line, come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Understand this, water is necessary to sustain life. Wine and milk are markers of luxury and abundance. And they provide more than that, especially when you don't have water purification systems and you take and you mix about a gallon of wine with about four gallons of water. It kills most of the bacteria and makes it safe to drink. It's actually a healthy thing. You've got water purification systems. You don't need to go home and mix wine with your water to drink it, okay? <laughs> Milk provides nutrition. God provides what we need, health, nutrition, and life without cost to us because he paid all the cost himself. And yet we often fear to take that abundance. We refuse to take it for ourselves. We would rather sit in a corner and nibble on a dry cracker than take the abundance that God offers. But we'll take the cracker that we've earned. But beyond that, we look at this abundance and sometimes we get a little concerned about it because while we'll take hold of that abundance for ourselves, we start kind of looking around going, I don't know if I want to share this. Because somehow in our mind, we've got this idea that God can provide enough for us, but He can't provide enough for everybody else. And yet here we sit as starving people who have been fully fed. And we refuse to tell other people where they can find me. We refuse to share with other people. We go around and we keep it secret. Sometimes we even keep it secret by the way that we live. We don't want anybody to realize that we're living like full people. So we go ahead and act like we've got the same set of problems that everybody else has got. We act like we've got the same set of priorities. Well, we've got to get out there. You know, Sundays are great for church. But on Monday, we've got to get out there and chase those same things that don't satisfy just like everybody else does. And we go to work on Monday morning. We go to school on Monday morning. We go to Facebook on Monday morning. And act just like everybody else acts. <coughs> like we're people who don't have things to satisfy. Like we're people that don't have God who satisfies. And yet, we have what would if we would only open our mouths and say so. Here is what satisfies. Here is what you need. Here is what God has provided. And there is an abundance. And there is an abundance for you. And there is an abundance for your neighbor. There is an abundance for your friend and for your enemy. There is an abundance for your family member. We'll let you decide whether it's a friend or a friend or enemy. Sometimes family members can be challenged. There is an abundance. There is an abundance, and it doesn't need to be reserved to people that look like you and think like you and talk like you. There is an abundance. There is an abundance enough <coughs> for people who will never speak a word of English in their life. And there is an abundance for people who speak English better than you do. There is an abundance for people who look like you and share your mark the same box when they're asked to fill out their ethnicity on the census form. And an abundance enough for people who mark different boxes. There's an abundance for that person that you think is enough for that person that you think is too rich to be worth anything, and enough for that person that you think is too poor to be worth anything. There is an abundance from God that is enough for every last person. <clears throat> And yet so often we start saying, well, we better be restrictive. We'll carry the gospel to this street, but we won't carry it to that street. 
We'll pray for this town, but we won't pray for that town. I'll go to church with those people, but I won't go to church with that kind of people. I'll go to church with people that like my music, but I won't go to church with people that don't like my music. I'll go to church with people that dress comfortably, but I'm not going to church with people that dress up fancy. I'm not going to go to church with people that dress up comfortably. Yeah, you got to be fancy when you go to church. As if God does not have an abundance of grace and mercy that's enough for everybody. And as if it's ours to control who gets it and who does it anyway. Folks, y'all are always, y'all are welcome to come, and, and we probably run out today uh, for lunch. But you're always welcome to come and say, hey, we'd like to come eat lunch at the preacher's house today. And if y'all would all come over to my house today, let me tell you who would decide who got lunch and who didn't. It wouldn't be you. Because you're not the one providing it. Ann and I would do our best to feed every last person that came in the door. You may eat canned soup today. We do our best to feed every last person that came in the door, but it's not yours to decide who eats and who doesn't. Now, if we come to your house, it's yours to decide who eats and who doesn't. And we need to understand that the grace of God is not our possession to decide who gets it and who doesn't. The feast, the waters, the wine and milk without money and without cost, the bread that will always satisfy, belongs to Him, and it's His feast. When you go to the book of Revelation and you see the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's not a place where the guests get to decide, wait a minute, I don't want that guy here. The bridegroom has already issued the invitations. It's his to decide. We so often want to restrict the grace of God. I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the people. He's not talking about David. He's talking about the son of David, the one who sits upon the throne of David for all eternity. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The one upon whom the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Because we are the nation that the Lord has called. Not the United States. Nothing inherently biblical or unbiblical, but in this case, the nation that's referred to as you read on through this are the people of every tribe and every tongue and of every race who call upon the name of the Lord who have listened to Isaiah 55, 6, when he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. So that is my call to you today. <clears throat> Seek the Lord. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. The Lord will have compassion on him. Return to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Today is the day turn and call out for God's pardon. Whether it's his pardon in the first place for being dead and refusing to allow life to come. Whether it's his pardon for those times that you've taken the grace of God and said, ah, I'll put this on the shelf and act like I don't have it. Whether it's those times that you said, hey, just in case I get in trouble, I've got God's grace sitting on the shelf. I can always pull it off and add it when I need it. Whatever it is, come and come to the waters. Turn your hearts back towards what the Lord has called you to do and come from this place willing to serve the Lord fully instead of holding back. We walk through the wilderness together. And we have the waters. Let's not ignore them and spend our efforts on things that don't satisfy. Let's pray again. Father, thank you day. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. We pray, Lord God, that you will help us as we strive.